please. The floor is yours. Okay. I'll start sharing so you should be able to see my screen now, I hope. Can you? Yes. Good. So presentation mode. There we go. So thank you very much for the introduction, Farouk. It's my pleasure to give a presentation to the AME GSC community today. And the topic I chose for this seminar is cyber physical social systems for personalized learning in the very specific context of the post pandemic era of education 4.0. So what is all this about? You will see I uh, have to connect quite a few dots for you all to be able to follow what I have in mind. And this is how the story begins. So first, uh, first of all, I will provide some context and some motivation. And it's interesting to realize that I wear different hats. I'm a researcher, I'm an educator, and I'm an administrator. So I get to look at certain things through different types of classes and sometimes end up with different results. Yet we need to connect the dots between these different viewpoints to be able to do the right things to create successful universities of the future. So as you all know, there is no such thing as a free lunch. So while you are, you are snacking away on whatever Farouk is providing, your task is here to think about what research opportunities may be worthwhile pursuing in the context of what I'm talking about so that we can pick this conversation up at the end of the talk. So let's start with a few post-pandemic challenges that the higher education sector at large is facing. It's not just in the UK, it's basically it's globally. So I selected a few here and you will soon see how they all relate. Most, if not all, historic universities have actually opted for slow pace change and slow pace transformation. And I've worked at enough in, uh, universities in my life to know that this is true for a fact. There are some examples, but many really, really have opted for slow pace change. High risk business models are in place at many institutions and we are overly dependent on international students and local face-to-face -face delivery on campus. Example from us here, I have about 70% of Chinese students in my classes and lots of them didn't come back at the beginning of the pandemic. And you can imagine what that means in terms of budgeting. Many institutions that were financially struggling pre-COVID are definitely much worse off now. And there are some actually facing bankruptcy. And I know another university from the London, Greater London area that cut three quarters of the course offerings and obviously then uh, a large number of staff as well. So that's a problem. Post pandemic, which is hopefully very, very soon, students will demand more from us. They will still want face to face experiences. So the face to face social experience on campus and they will want online for convenience. So we have to do more to keep them happy and keep the student satisfaction rates as high up as we, as we used to do. At the same time, we're facing some challenges from a government point of view. So government funding priorities are changing and the government will support what they call valuable and employability fostering courses. So if you study a STEM subject, you are more likely to be able to earn decent wages shortly after graduation and pay back your student loans. But there are other courses for which there still is a demand, but in which students usually do not pay, this, pay back their student loans. So the government will shift the funding priorities here. What does it mean for the faculty teaching those courses, for these departments? Lots of challenges. There's also a lot of talk about potential reduction of tuition fees. And then we say, oh, well then, if you cut the fees, I'll just uh, get a few more folks in. No, they're also talking about introducing student caps. Then I'm really in trouble. So some universities have plenty of space. They could just bring in more students, but then they are capped. So what do I do? I have a lot less money coming in. I need to deliver a better, a better experience. And I will probably lose some of the departments that are not deemed valuable as in employability fostering. So very controversial things going on in the higher education sector. A lot of talk about it. And then the last one is somewhat different, and that's why I underlined it. We do have a digital skills shortage. That means our con the content of our programs, our curricula, is oftentimes very, very dated, 
and doesn't really deliver any of these things that we talk about in industry for like cyber physical systems and the data analytics and you know, all these all the all these smart manufacturing topics and so on likewise in terms of delivery mode we're still doing a lot of very very traditional education many of the faculty are not as tech savvy as they should be and interestingly many of the students aren't either which we have experienced at the beginning of the pandemic and this then also relates to the student engagement that i talked about a few minutes uh, before we came online so not all students engage equally well in online sessions than they do in face-to-face -face sessions so student learning student assessment also needs to embrace digital skills much 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 more so this is basically the context and the motivation for what i want to do today so as i said your task identify opportunities to address these challenges challenges always come along with opportunities right so my idea here is to as i said talk about education in the post-pandemic world and i believe the university of 2041 so which is like 20 years down the road will be very different from the university we know today. Now put yourselves in the shoes of your children who may be studying in 20 years time or in the shoes of your future self being a professor at one of these universities in 20 years time. What do you envision? Will your daily life look like? Try to write it down, just half a page of notes, put it away and in 20 years time, look at it. And that will be an, ex an interesting experience. So the university, the university of 2041 or so, I think, uh, will embrace or will be based, based on three different pillars. The first pillar is what I call the new global university. And it's actually a thing. So if you do some online research and look up what's out there on the new global university, you will come across quite a bit of content. I will talk about all these in detail in a minute. So within this, new global universities, we will deliver what we now call, for lack of a better term, maybe education 4.0, similar to um, industry 4.0, as we say at the moment. So here in this tile for education 4, I put empowerment, embracing change, learning ecosystems, digital technology, new types of pedagogy. So different things than we see today. And then one specific aspect of education 4.0 will be personalized learning. And that is something universities can use to have a unique sales point. So if you're able to deliver personalized learning experiences to students, you will be in a very, very good position to distinguish yourselves from the rest. So what is traditional learning? We'll also talk about that a little bit. And as I said earlier, I want to connect the dots between these three different topics of philosophy. So let me talk about the first one. Characteristics of this new global university or NGU as we sometimes say. And the most fascinating thing for me is that Farouk and Janet and a few others talked about this. So all of us, when we were at GT Savannah like 12, 13, 14 years ago, we talked about many of the things that now have just become a topic. So quite interesting to see that actually things are now coming together. So first, the future of higher education institutions lies in IT and all inclusive distance learning plans to maximize opportunity and to balance risk at the same time. Remember, I talked about uh, risky business models. So if we put all eggs in one basket, the students don't turn it up, we're done. If we're doing everything face to face, and we have a pandemic, we're done. So there'll be a lot more online as you can all imagine. And the second one, remote learning and online or blended delivery are indeed core strategies in formulating, preserving and spreading knowledge. It's not just an add-on that the better universities do to some extent, it'll be core business for all of us. NGUs are structures very interesting here neither constrained by place nor by parochial insignias of government and states what does that mean think about it neither constrained by place nor all these things here ngus are open access establishments influenced and enriched by cultural and intellectual import of their community 
across distances and locations. And now think about this seminar and the community we're in, we're part of this already. Faculty can apply to join NGUs from all regions of the planet and must have at their disposal the best means and methods to serve and empower communities of students and scholars worldwide. And I know there'll be lots of people piping up, yeah, this can't be done and that can't be done, but is that any other reason? There are hurdles, but we can overcome these hurdles. And as I said earlier, we already talked about this more than 10 years ago. So it's doable, I know it for a fact. And as Walt Disney once said, if you can dream it, you can do it. And sometimes I like to be a dreamer. Number six, NGUs form global networks for the production and exchange of skills and ideas. There'll be a shift towards shorter and customizable degree programs. So I believe three, four, five year degree programs are a bit uh, outdated. And there'll be more emphasis on degree apprenticeships, on CPD, on upscaling and these things, and perhaps a subscription model for lifelong learning. Sometimes I call it a Netflix degree of sorts, for lack of a better term now. So I could imagine that students would get a subscription for two or three learning units. One may be what we now call a bachelor's degree, one may be what we call a CPD course or a short course. And throughout a number of years, they can use these tickets to get a piece of education from the university. So I could imagine something like this. And then the last one here, diversity of uh, NGUs, community of faculty and students and their power, and this is important, and their power to network and influence academe, irrespective of time difference, irrespective of geographical location and cultural background, actually takes precedence over quality and splendor of buildings, facilities, and stringently competitive admissions requirements. So something very different to what we are all very familiar with. All right. So that was pillar one. What about the two other pillars? So education in the age of industry four. So education needs to keep up with industry four. And we talk a lot about these uh, four industrial revolutions. So we all know the story here from industry one, the steam engine, and all the way up to industry three with the automation and industry four with the cyber physical systems. And this is basically uh, the, manu the manufacturing history picture that we use in almost all the talks at the moment. But what about education? How has education changed? If I want to look at education 1.0, what would it be? Individual learning. Trainees learn skills through apprenticeships. Yeah, I experienced that some 35 years ago or so. Education 2.0, mass education in schools. So the teacher teaches the whole class in the same way, done. You learn, you learn how to read and write, and that's it. Okay, we've had that. And then computers came in and smartphones and iPads and all these things. And what happened? Did we embrace this technology to make education better? No. Pre-COVID, many of my colleagues used to go ballistic whenever a student would use a phone or a tablet or whatever in the lecture because they always assume they're playing around with something. It's not the case. As I said, I have so many Chinese students, many of them actually just translate words they don't understand. So there's good reason for using computers, but not a lot has really changed, right? So here, education 4.0 4.0 hasn't really happened. Computers and internet changed the paradigm for industry. Education, however, has not really changed a lot over the past 100 years, and this is quite shocking. All right, so how do we go from uh, education three to education four? So I put a few things on the slide here. In the old world, People said, oh, a student's brain is empty. It's like an empty container. That's not true. Future mental model is more students have prior knowledge, which is constructed in a different way by each student. So no one size fits all. Then the old fashioned view, students must first be, first be taught all the basis of everything, all the basic knowledge to advance to the next level. Whereas the basic knowledge actually hasn't really changed that much, hasn't really been modernized in, in many, time, many, many examples, and it's often quite un unsuitable. Okay. Computers interfere with thinking. Oh, that's a dangerous one. The more the education for related view here is then computers allow students to explore beyond boundaries of the classroom. Using computers, we can apply active learning and sharpen our thinking. 
And then the last one, learning is one directional from the professor to the students. You do as I tell you and you'll be fine. Whereas Education 4.0 is about self-learning, educators mentor students who teach you how to learn. So you learn how to learn and become a lifelong learner. Students then explore knowledge. Students, professors and peers collaborate and they all learn constantly collaboratively. Very different point of view, very, very important. And I don't want to go through all, all these examples here, so just one aligning industry requirements with education. So when we look at industry, we have flexible production lines and education that might translate to tailored or custom-made degree programs and learning pathways. So there are these analogies across the board. It's basically mapping industry four on what happened in the manufacturing domain to the education domain. So a bit more about education 4.0, which I think is the new tomorrow. What is it? How does it work? What will be different? So first, first of all, it is an approach to learning that aligns itself with the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, not too hard to digest. For universities to continue to produce successful graduates, they must prepare their students for a world where cyber physical systems are prevalent across all industries and education itself is such an industry or business. Absolutely. And this means teaching students about this technology as part of the curriculum is important and changing the approach to teaching and learning and assessment altogether, utilizing industry for technologies or base technologies, as I sometimes say, to improve the university experience. So this is the trick. If we get this right, we will stay in business. And we will be very competitive. Preparing students for evolving industries. That is the purpose. That's why we're doing this. So cyber physical systems are becoming integrated into various industries, inevitably affecting the skills requirements for employability. There is not just one industry sector and where you all of a sudden need to know something about computers. So every, everybody talks about big data analysis in whatever domain. It doesn't matter if it's manufacturing, if it's healthcare, there's all sorts of areas in which we need this. It doesn't help me if, if I have a great welding expert who has absolutely no idea about anything IT. It doesn't help me if I have an IT expert who has no idea about anything engineering, then I'll never be able to set up a cyber physical system for production engineering. So all these things are connected. Due to industry four, 60% of all occupations could have a third of their activities automated. That's quite threatening. So you better pick up the right skills quickly. Industry four will impact the soft skills that students will need in the future. And I have those soft skills on the next slide. More than a third of the desired core skills set of most occupations will be comprised of skills that are not yet considered crucial to the job, but will become indispensable very, very, very soon. So this is a radical statement. So we really have to change a lot and change things in a quite radical way to, to get on the right pathway, I believe. Job roles are becoming more flexible and adaptable. Yeah, our university now already uh, implements hybrid working for for non-faculty, so all the student support staff will be in the office like one day a week or two days a week or something like that on a rota basis. So it's all coming already. A lot of what we did during the pandemic will stay. Education 4.0 is about ev evolving with the times and for higher education institutions. This means understanding what is required of their future graduates. So we have to really think about change here. Now these soft skills that I talked about uh, a minute ago, the top 10 digital skills, education 4.0 demands. And this is a slide I really like. So everybody who grew up in the SRL community will have these skills. So we were all raised to have these skills and that is why I'm proud to be part of this community. And just, I'm sure you will all laugh when I go through these, so I don't probably have to go through all 10, just complex problem solving. We are engineering designers. That's what we do. That's at the core of what we do. Critical thinking, if you, if you can't think critically, you can't solve these problems. Creativity, people management, coordinating with others and collaborating, but also empathy, very important for designers and emotional intelligence. 
especially when it comes to managing teams and all these things, very important. Sound judgment and decision making. Now service orientation, this is a very industry four related one. Now we talk about everything as a service, not just software infrastructure and platform. We can do almost anything as a service now. Negotiation skills and cognitive flexibility also very important. So these, these, are, these are skills future employees need to be successful. And then two more points on this, a new approach to learning is what Education 4 is all about. So it's about aligning teaching and learning methods, not just the technical content with the skills needed. And this connection usually isn't there when I look at what's happening at the moment. Accelerated remote learning, students learn theory remotely using digital means, whilst practical skills are learned face-to-face -face in a laboratory or in some other kind of activity on campus. So it's a bit like uh, the continuation of the flipped classroom of a few years ago. Education 4 requires students to learn how to adapt quickly to new situations they may face in their evolving careers. Yep, you have to be able to adapt. Agility is the word that we sometimes use to describe this. And the approach to exams and assessments will also change, moving away from traditional method of absorbing and relaying a vast amount of information which is a skill that is not really that necessary to be successful in the future. So at the moment, almost all of our exams and assessment are pretty old fashioned, I have to admit. Now, this one here is very important. That's why I highlighted it and put a frame around it. It's that important. Adapting to new realities. Higher education institutions are moving towards a more personalized way of learning. And that can be a very unique sales point. So this is now alluding to the personalized learning I want, to, I want to talk about in a minute. By utilizing data and tracking student performance. So remember, it's all digital. We need to embrace digitization. Universities will be able to identify struggling students and provide optimized learning strategies to suit their needs. And I don't mean some nice person in a student support office. I mean computer programs running in the background. So the computer can actually pick up who is struggling with what and how that content could be delivered better or what intermediate steps need to be taken. So all, so all of you now need to think about what is it really what a computer could do and how could we make this happen? Because in the end, I want to arrive at some research ideas. Education 4.0 embraces this advance in analytics. So there's, there's, there we go again, the big data analytics and so on, and uses it to treat each student as an individual understanding that everyone's learning needs and desired outcomes will be different. And there's another very important one embedded in here. So through the data analytics, we sometimes can identify mental health issues that students may have early on and prevent bad things from happening. And that, especially during the pandemic, uh, the, the increase in mental health issues is just enormous. So computers could really help us here. And lastly, possibility of entirely customizable degrees come to mind, whereby a student can select courses from multiple programs or partner institutions, referring back to the new global universities. So is it possible that I get an accredited degree with three courses from Oklahoma, two courses from Liverpool, and another course from, from Buffalo? Is that possible? And I know all the reasons why people might say this is difficult and that could not be done. But it is possible if we want to, and I would not be uh, I would not be surprised to see some of these things happening rather sooner than later. So we, we can talk about this later on and have a good discussion. So now it's a moment to pause a little bit and say, okay, hmm, that was interesting. So but, but what has that to do with cyber physical social systems? And that's why I brought this slide up. It's partially copied from one of Farouk's presentations on this topic of cyber physical social systems. And there are two things I need to, to mention, a key notion. So we, and when I say we, I mean, usually I refer to the systems realization wider community, systems realization laboratory wider community. We perceive the evolving cyber physical social system to be comprised of several services to be modeled as multi echelon network, thereby ensuring the framework to be used to design it as agnostic to the services embodied therein. Well, that's a proper academic statement. Right. The research thrust to go along with this, we hypothesize that all grand challenges can be modeled as cyber physical social systems. And 
public policy is foundational for addressing grand challenges. And this is where some of the problems that I alluded to earlier can be addressed. So all these people who say, oh, NGU, what about employment laws? What about pension? What about health insurance? What about the legal framework of how we operate? What about accreditation? Ooh, lots and lots and lots and lots of things. Yes, that's why public policy is important. What about policies uh, relating to the use of data? What about uh, ethics in AI and so on? So all these topics relate to that and need to be addressed as well. And you can already see this is highly complex, not just technical. So we're envisioning the smart universities of the future as ecosystems of CPSS, cyber physical social systems. So smart universities, smart classrooms, smart pedagogy, smart software, hardware technology, smart administration, smart research, smart curriculum, quite interesting. And I, and I refer to the uh, grand challenges here and advancing personalized learning, which I think will be a key ingredient in the education 4.0 framework delivered in these NGUs of the future is actually one of the current 14 NAE grand challenges. And I looked at that a while ago and I thought this is really, really awesome. And here in the UK, I've come across the first university now who has advancing personalized learning hardwired into their strategic plan for the next 10 years. So it is happening. People have picked up on it. Now, what is it all about? Here is the slide copied from the NAE website. Instruction can be individualized based on learning styles, on learning speeds and interests to make learning more reliable. So there's plenty of evidence that suggests that advancing or that personalized learning actually makes the experience better and students learn, fa learn faster and they learn deeper. So there's, there's a better chance to achieve deep learning versus strategic learning or surface learning. Now these grand challenges that we currently see on the NAE website, I've put them all here, all 14, they are not isolated grand challenges. So many of them relate to others and they're intertwined in a way. And I highlighted four here. So the one here is advanced personalized learning. And I thought, well, that has a lot to do with computers and personal data and so on that must uh, have, a, have a link to cybersecurity. But then learning itself has a lot to do with the brain. So there's another grand challenge, reversing or reverse engineering the brain. And there's another grand challenge, enhancing virtual reality, because we already see uh, in experimental setups avatars popping up in the student's bedroom at eight o'clock in the morning delivering a lecture. So we see the upper avatars at the moment if you're into, into music and so on. So there's lots of interesting stuff happening, but what is all the research in these areas and how do we connect it? So it's very interdisciplinary as you can imagine. So as I said, many of these challenges are intertwined and require cross-disciplinary collaboration. And that's why I put at least the four ones that are separated on this slide and I want to just briefly talk about these two. So advancing personalized learning, the growing appreciation of individual preferences and aptitudes has led toward more personalized learning in which instruction is tailored to a student's individual needs. And given the diversity of individual preferences and the complexity of each human brain, developing teaching methods that optimize learning will require engineering solutions of the future. So we're not yet very good at this. And then this one here is absolutely fascinating, reverse engineering the brain. A lot of research has been focused on creating thinking machines, computers, that is, capable of emulating human intelligence. AI is in everybody's head at the moment. However, reverse engineering the brain could have multiple impacts that go far beyond AI and will promise great advances in healthcare, in manufacture, in communication, and in education. So that's the one they forgot here. I would, I would have added that. So you see the relationships here, and that's why I think uh, this, this, this research on the boundary between medical things and IT and engineering is, is super exciting. So that's why I really love doing these things. So now the, the main topic, and I had to wait uh, until now to actually introduce it, but I needed all these other points really to connect the dots between what's going on in the sector and why this matters. So some key points. Instruction can be personalized based on the learning styles, you know, that speeds, interests, 
Some people pick up things by reading. Some people just need to crack 20 problems and then they figure out the theory. Some people need clear instruction and just follow the steps and so on. So everybody's different. No one size fits all. Brains are not alike. We need to understand how the brain works and model the brain to understand how learning works. So that's the other grand challenge. Teaching has traditionally followed this one size fits all approach to learning with a single set of instructions provided identically to everybody in a given class, regardless of differences in aptitude or interest. Not very good, we can do better. Similar inflexibility has persisted in adult education programs that often ignore differences in age, cultural background, occupation, and level of motivation. And I have an example here from my classes. When I teach Paul and Byte's design approach, it's pretty old in its original form. Sometimes I take the book and I say, come on guys, this is 60, 70 years old. There must be something better. And I throw it in the trash. And then the British students usually laugh. They understand what I'm after. And I want to redesign this and make it better. But some of the Asian students are absolutely shocked that I use an established textbook and just bang it in the trash and say it's no good. So, but it's different cultures. So we learn in different ways. And then personal learning approaches range from courses that students can master at their own pace two computer programs designed to match the way it presents content with a learner's personality. And here are some of these different learning styles. You, you're already familiar with these, I suppose. So verbal, oral, visual, physical, social, logical, solitary. Some people really have to do everything on their own in isolation. Others are far better if they study with their peers. Some people are visual. They use mind maps for learning to connect the dots between topics. And others just, just read it or whatever, or logical, just go through the equations once and that's it. So everybody is different. And now imagine the computer programs of the future, the learning environments, the, learning, the virtual learning environments of the future, what will they be like? How will I enroll in a program? Where will the content for that program comes, come from? How will I be taught? Will there be people? To what extent? Will there be computer support? To what extent? Can the computer system figure out which learning style is the best for me? Can it change me? Should it change me? Don't know. What about exams? What will exams look like 20 years from now? They won't be what we know, what, what they are today. And how can computer technology and engineering technology and medical research, brain research, how can all of this help us to make it happen? That's what I'm excited about. Why is personalized learning useful? Obviously, some learners are highly self-motivated and self-driven, not everyone, learning best by exploring a realm of knowledge on their own, or at least with very little guidance. So generally, that would be me. I just like to figure it out myself. Other learners prefer some coaching and more structured approach. They are typically self-motivated when the subject matter appeals to them, not otherwise. Still another type is more often motivated by external rewards and may learn best with step-by-step -step instructions. May yeah, never worked for me, but works for, for some other cultures quite well. Truly personalized learning could be even more subtly individualized within the basic types of learners. Some prefer to learn by example, as I already said, others by finding answers to questions and others by solving problems on their own. And under different conditions, people might even switch their preferences preferring examples in some contexts, but equations in others. Many personalized learning efforts to make use of computerized instruction, and they're often in the classroom or via the internet. So we have basic elements of this, that nothing is really advanced at the moment. If you've ever tried, tried computer-based grading, you probably know what I'm talking about, and then you sometimes wish you would not tried that. Among them are intelligent web-based education systems, development of recommender systems that guide individual learning using web-based resources and creation of algorithms that adjust recommendations to the ability of students. So very interesting thoughts. How do you make that happen? How do you understand or test which somebody's preferred or most suitable learning style in a given situation or context is and why that might be the case and so on? What personal learning systems are available now? Web-based education systems are already common. So the usual virtual learning environments we use, the blackboards, the canvas, and whatever these systems are called that we have at the moment. Systems have been designed for storing instructional content. So they're basically content management systems. 
delivering content to students and facilitating the interaction between instructors and learners. Multimedia modules for information can provide text, audio, video, animation, static graphic, and any other suitable for the student. The delivery of instructional material is an important part of personalized learning, but we need to customize more than the content. We need to customize the entire experience, experience, uh, experience of teaching, of learning, of understanding, and of assessing. So for example, different sequences are used in intelligent tutoring systems to deliver content tailored for each individual. So here's the sequences. Aspects of this approach may include the use of pre-assessments to gauge an individual's most effective learning habit. And the information collected can then be used to modify the sequence of material presented. So we see this in other contexts already. Many methods for optimizing the order of presentation have been explored. So typical approach here is genetic algorithms, eliminates unsuccessful presentation sequences and modifies successful ones for a new round of tests and then continue learning and improve. And recommended systems are widely encountered on the web, search engines that fail to find a particular term often recommend alternatives. So for instance, uh, and, and pages that sell books or music will suggest alternatives that you may, may like, movies that you would like and so on. And why, why, why are we not seeing the same in education yet? So I believe that will be coming eventually. So that should be uh, enough background and scope what I'm interested in here. So now again, it's time to pause and reflect and discuss a bit of a discussion. Let us speculate about the future. What may become possible in terms of the NGUs, the Education 4.0, and in particular, the cyber physical social systems for advancing personalized learning? Because that's the, that's the research that I want to focus on in the long run here. Do pose critical questions relevant to advancing personalized learning through CPSS as part of an education 4.0 CP ecosystem? And with that, let the conversation begin. And hopefully, we'll write a nice paper about this in the not too distant. And now I'll stop sharing and I can see you all again. Hopefully, nobody fell asleep. Thank you very much for listening. Farouk, you're muted. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, we are ready for comments and questions. So, uh, Marie Dallam, then Nasli Razuli, please unmute yourself, turn on your camera and ask your comments, make your comments, questions. Go ahead. Who else? You can, Marie, go ahead. Oh, I was actually just giving him the applause. I didn't have a question <laughs> right now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nasli, go ahead. Yeah, I also do not have a question. Thank you so much for your presentation. Pleasure. Comments, observations. Yes, Shakuntala. Cannot hear you. They have the bad Nothing. microphones. <laughs> uh, sorry, me? Uh, Shakuntala. She's having trouble getting her mic to work. Though. Okay. So who, uh, Shagundala, get your mic done, speak up, and who else? Sean, Joel, Manuel, Monique, Rodney, Roshan, Marie, Kemper, go ahead. Um, yeah, I have, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, some comments and questions. Um, yeah, thank you for this talk. Um, yeah, personalized learning is something I've, always been very interested on like how we can do better with that um and i feel like in the u.s our pipeline is sort of like broken at the grade school level um let alone the university level um and sort of like the current structure only really helps support a very small demographic of students um and i think technology is sort of like key for us to be able to really help um address like individual and personal needs um, and also the fact that like a lot of problems are becoming more interdisciplinary. So it mm. sort of requires that people have a larger knowledge base. Like they can't just specialize in one thing like they can, but they should also have a breadth of knowledge in, in sort of other fields. Um, and so, yeah, I was wondering uh, also if you thought about like how you, how we sort of expand the, the breadth of knowledge that people have so they can 
really sort of take advantage of their own expertise. I think a lot of education content will be will become more cross-disciplinary. So when I look at capstone design courses, for example, at the moment, our capstone is purely mechanical. And occasionally you get a little bit of aerospace in the mix, but we just don't have one between mechanical and electrical or even mechanical, electrical and computer science. So that would be a step into the right direction. I believe not only the research will continue to be very uh, interdisciplinary, but also the education programs as a whole will become more interdisciplinary. It's a bit against the tradition of keeping things in silos. And I know people need to think about budget spreadsheets and resources and where they belong. And I know that's some of my pain sometimes, but hey, I think we need to embrace change. So yeah, very good point. And like yourself, my PhD is in computer science and I've now worked in engineering or the interface between computer science and engineering for 25 years. So yes, you have to be in various sides of what's going on to be, to be able to make a difference, I think. I'd like to add to what Dirk has said and Filani, you are next. Uh, the question you've raised is about knowledge. There are two types of knowledge. One is, is process-based knowledge and the other is domain-dependent knowledge. So the domain dependent knowledge is what we have focused on so far. We have not given an opportunity for students to learn how to, what processes to use for them to be able to continue learning. And so what is needed at a university at the undergraduate level, graduate level, all over the uh, uh, curriculum is providing an opportunity for students with different learning styles to empower them to continue learning. So there are two types of knowledge, uh, Monique. Domain-dependent knowledge and process-based knowledge. We are good at domain-dependent knowledge. We show students how to solve problems using patterns, how to pattern match. So, you, so, the, so we give them problem sets, people do the problem sets, the problems are, the, the patterns are embodied in their minds. Give them another problem, they'll be able to recall that pattern, change the problem a bit, some can do it, to come up with a new pattern, others cannot do it. So that is what we have to focus on and make things happen. Filani, your, 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 your comment. <clears throat> Hello, uh, can you hear me now? I was happy. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so it's, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I was thinking, you know, what are your thoughts um, on the role of augmented reality in this new um, fourth, this fourth um, generation of, of education, especially in how it can be better suited to um, address the ever-changing, um, you know, world compared to maybe more physical, uh, si like systems and physical labs that universities all have? I think that's very important. And I think um, the demand for augmented reality and mixed reality is actually growing. So there are some universities that just cannot afford all the laboratories and resources they would need to provide quality education in everything they do. So they could utilize this. We have here a virtual engineering center and we're doing things like that. So for example, here in automotive engineering, we don't have a degree in automotive engineering, but we do a lot of automotive engineering research. So, so students can actually learn how to change tires in a Formula One racing car that way. And it really, I've, I've, I've tried it, it's absolutely amazing. And that's also a bridge into delivering laboratory experiments in, in virtual settings when we have a pandemic or something of sorts. It also forces people to think about, can I actually degree, or can I offer degree programs in, multi, in multiple variants? Can I have a degree in X on campus? Can I have one completely online? And can I have a blended one to accommodate all the potential learners? So that way I would maximize opportunity for profit. Sorry for having to say this, but it's what administrators sometimes see. And I'm minimizing the risk. So if there is a pandemic and I cannot do it on campus, so what I have online and anything in between and I can cater to the needs of everyone. So absolutely coming. I think it's a very good point. Thank you. 
Great. Second color, and then Russian. Cannot hear you, Shakuntala. <laughs> you may need to back out and come back in, because I know that I've had to do that before. Yeah, OK. Back out and come back in. Uh, Roshan, go ahead. Um, I think um, what I was thinking was how, how I guess like it is two part question. So first being um, how, as Farouk had said, like how do we how do we do like a diagnosis or some kind of a test where we actually can figure out what would be the best way for a person to learn, like what is what is the best suited process for them in this scenario, and other thing, how do you think testing will work in this kind of a scenario like how would uh, how would the key performance indexes of these students within the system of being virtual can be determined and so now we physically come give tests and they get graded so how would that change so you talk talking about performance metrics and so on we're always interested in retention rates. We don't want to see many students fail, right? So we try to keep those low. Right. We also want to graduate students faster. If you can learn something in two years that currently takes three years, it will be much cheaper for you. That's a lot of money you have to spend right. at the moment, right? The workforce has an ever-growing demand at the moment. We're just not producing the graduates we need for the industry for a while. It's just not happening. But there's other challenges on why it's not happening, which are more of political na uh, nature. Will this happen? I put down, I put down a 20 years as a timeline. I think um, some universities will be early ad adopters. They will go very, very quickly at putting this into place and try to uh, separate them from the pack, if you will. And then there will be a few who can do something later and a few will never get it. And remember the challenges I had on my first slide, there are many cha challenges at the moment, financial challenges and so on. If you're not able to adapt, if you're not able to innovate, you're going to be out. So post-pandemic, if somebody says, we're doing same old, same old, and all will be back to normal, forget about it. Not going to happen. We already have quite a few institutions over here, which are at the brink of bankruptcy. You have to say it this hard. They're just barely in the blacks, if at all. And many are tens and tens and tens of millions in the reds. For all the obvious reasons that have been made in the past that weren't quite that obvious then. So Professor Hein Professor Hindsight knows everything better, as we know. Yeah, so that's a pretty much so it'll 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 come. Some will adapt early. And I remember one example from Georgia Tech a few years ago, two or three years ago, they created a teaching assistant that was a robot. None of the students ever realized it was a robot and not a human being. So Asha Gold's work at Georgia Tech, if you look that up, they had lots of publicity about that. So these things are happening. It's just very early days. Akuntala is back. Yes, one last shot. Am I audible? Yes. Excellent. So firstly, thank you. And uh, Namaskar from India. I'm very pleased to be here and listen to your talk. I'm very excited because we are facing a similar conversation out here. Uh, we're discussing about how to take particularly design education. Uh, and the pandemic has hit us hard because yeah. of obviously not having the, the, you know, the feasibility to have our students on campus and have studio. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, we are uh, contemplating and I look forward to uh, your mentorship as oh, is great. Professor Misty helping us out. Um, my questions are, uh, you spoke about how we need to empower students to adapt quickly to new situations uh, in their evolving career. Uh, but when we look at cognitive development, isn't higher education a bit too late, already formative? Should we not aim this much earlier in school? Or if so, how do we how do we address that? That's my first question. Okay, I, I agree with you. The earlier we do this, the better. Yes, we, we, we're quite late in the game. And at the moment, all these cool things, or most of these great things are happening at graduate level, not at undergraduate level, not to mention yeah. earlier school kids level. Yeah, I, I agree. 
And to some extent, it varies uh, based on what kind of education you can afford and what circumstances you grow up in, which is not equal opportunity, right? right. We, want, we want equal opportunity. So computers, again, could help us there, I think. Yeah. yeah what's your next question? Yes. Um, the next, again, on the same lines about adapting. Uh, to the new situations. Here I'm questioning that as we progress further and further and depend largely on digital technologies, um, how do we uh, ensure that we are still imbibing real life experiences and real life learning? Um, In my personal opinion, hybrid is probably the way to go. So we do need social interactions and we yeah. behave differently in real settings. So an online lecture, through Zoom University is definitely different than what I do in a classroom. Farouk said he's getting better at doing things online. I think I'm still better in a classroom because I have fun, I walk around, I pick on students, I throw things into the room and all sorts of things that I cannot really do in a, in a virtual setting. So, and, and it's uh, being among other people and interacting on a social level is very important. And just yeah. getting, getting the wives face to face and the atmosphere, I think you need this, that's why I see the future basically in, in, in blended programs where you have maybe the theory online to some extent, and then you get to meet the cohort and do something in a physical mm -hmm. environment. It's, it's, it's part of the experience of growing up. And there's also the yep. uh, side of social student life. Like when I go shopping, yes. I go shopping to a place where the students go shopping sometimes, and I know what they carry home on their shoulders. It's usually like a 24 pack or something. And then the next morning they're <laughs> over in my class. Yeah, okay, we've all been students once, so can't blame them. It's part of growing up and all of that. It makes, it's part of the university experience. It, just, it is what it is. My heart really breaks to see so many students missing that out. Absolutely. I, I, uh, my I, last I, question. I'd like to, um, wait, wait, Shakuntala. I want to answer your two questions. The yes, first please. one is, is it too late? I believe it's never too late. Mm -hmm. It's only too late to start. So if we, if we started at uh, 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 focused on what we have control on, we have control with university students, we have control with the yes. IITs. So yes. focus on that. What's the use of yes. saying, what can we do at the other thing? Somebody else is going to do that if they want to right. do it. The second right. thing is that we are dealing with a different type of student coming to the university. These are these are digital natives. These are not people like us who did not grow up with an iPad and stuff like that. So we have to think differently. Their socialization is totally different. And so this notion of saying they have to physically meet, they have to physically do this, that's our mental model, but that may not be the mental model of the Facebook generation. So right. we have to be very careful as to what we are saying, we have to do that, we have to do that. That's from our perspective, but think about the digital right. natives. Go ahead. That's my perspective. So I, I, I so, so I, I have this uh, slightly different attitude. Focus on the next generation, not on what we believe the next generation should be doing. Don't make them like us. Let yeah. them grow. <laughs> right. But, Thank you. Uh, I, I'm really. I find that really refreshing and encouraging. And that's true. Um, I too find it. Uh, I'm still learning on this whole Instagram lingo. Uh, um, so, uh, my, my, so your third question, and then I'll have Rachel answer. answer yes, question. please. Yes, okay, please. Thank ahead. you so much. Um, the question, the third question is forward looking uh, about the next 20 years that you have forecast. And uh, my question is, if we are to, um, what, what would be the precursor to self learning? Are we there? I mean, once again, when we're looking towards personalizing education, and if that decision is on to me to personalize my education, or say my son who will be in college in say 20 years, um, what is it that he requires to be empowered to make good decisions for the self? Good question, uh, various things. Whoever enters, if it's higher education or further education, doesn't really matter all that much. Is there a need for what you learn? Will you be employable? So here in the UK, there is always a huge focus on employability. If you study something that will not allow you to ever put food on your table, it will not be supported. There's, there is a market for it, but it's 
probably not going to help you. So is there a need for what you learn? The time spans become much faster. So we can no longer say, I get a degree and I'm good for the next 20 years. So it's this notion of becoming lifelong learner and you need to be self-driven. It's not possible for somebody to take care of you all your life. So you need to get it that you need to stay on the ball. So that's why personally, I have always been very high on what we call continuous professional development. So I'm a member of many of these bodies and learn societies. And every year I have to give a record of what I have done to keep my knowledge up to speed, so to speak. So what, what I've learned, I mean, you cannot teach the same stuff 30 years. I've, I've had professors like that in the past, but then you look at slide number one and there is a reference from 1953 and it's like, holy cow, right? So you can't do that. The, the content needs to be current, but we also need to think about um, customizable content. Not everybody needs to learn exactly the same thing. So we need a common understanding. So there may be probably more foundation degrees of sorts with the absolute core basics of what you have to have, and then more specialization areas. We do that at the moment, or we've been doing this for a while. So our first year is general engineering, and you can still after one year decide if you want to be a Mac Eng, an aerospace Eng, a design engineer, or even a civil engineer. And then later on, after year two, you can still jump around between Mac, Aero, and design, but no longer between civil. Well, that's then civil and architecture totally different. Although they have the digital build environment, and again, there is some overlap in terms of these skills now. I think we will see shorter degrees, a uh, higher degree of customization. But with an administrator's head on, I also need to think about how can I make it happen? Where do the resources come from? What are the fees that I can get through what model? And where's the break even point? So I, I can have totally different views on all of this. And when I talk about embracing digitization, we talk about this in the university here, then some instructors say, oh, that's great. I want to be a wonderful educator and I want to use all the things with all the bells and whistles that are available, just give me the money, right? And then maybe I have to come up with the money if it makes sense. But I also think about how do I afford all of this? Or I think, how can I spend money on this to deliver things more efficiently. Can I do it once and invest? And then, so to speak, earn money while I sleep and just use it 500 times. And then the dedicated educator will say, how dare you say that? Right? So, so sometimes we clash with these points of views. That's why I kind of enjoy wearing different pants at different times. It's always a lot of tension in the room when these topics come up. Great. Uh, Thank you. Shakuntala, you've raised a very interesting point. There's a difference between teaching and learning. I can teach people content, but I cannot teach people how to learn. I can provide an opportunity for people to learn. And Rachel has taken one of my courses, so I'm going to invite her to say, okay, you had the opportunity to learn, Rachel, what did you get out of it? Um, well, I mean, like that particular course was more kind of helping me figure out strategies for how to learn um, things like how to organize myself and how to look at things at different angles to try to figure them out um, so it was a little bit different from a usual class um, kind of tricky to learn because as he said he can't exactly hand you the uh, how to learn it's kind of an internal thing but he can give you a whole bunch of materials essentially I guess giving you like all the soil and uh, light and stuff but it's kind of on you to take that and try to figure it out yourself um, but yeah, I, I do think that's kind of generally the way to go because these days um, things move very, very, very fast um, and you can't really rely on what you've learned even like a couple of years ago, it's obsolete by then. So you really need to learn how to adapt very, very quickly. So the key, it's more like learning the key foundational skills of how to do that, I guess. And Shagunkala, you asked the question, what, how should you prepare your child for university? My wife and I have written a two or three page document on parenting. And I will send that to you so that you can take a look at that because the, the really thing that. is to get them curious. If the child gets mm -hmm. curious and the child has confidence in asking questions to satisfy that curiosity, then the child is ready for university. So I will send it to you, it, it, it's on Thank you, I appreciate that very much. And thank you for all the time to all, thank you. So uh, closing comments, I think we uh, we have about five, 10 minutes left. Closing comments from anybody. Uh, Latif, Jason, 
Nasli, Filani, Monique, Marie, Roshan, uh, Rachel? Mm, I mean, for me, I think it's a very interesting path that our education system is going to take. It would be interesting for my point of view because I am also one of those future academicians and like my passion or my aim is to be one. So, so just, to, just to see the process start and probably be a part of one so that I become the part of the cycle, it's pretty interesting. Um, I'm kind of excited as well because I've always, my aim has been to have better delivery of content to students and to be able to cater to their needs. And so, yeah, I think um, hopefully technology pushes us into the right direction and then we have everything ready for, let's say, next 10 years to come. So, yeah, very excited to see this space evolve. Great. Who else would like to do a closing comment? Jason, Filani, Nasli, Latif, Monique. Yeah, thank you very uh, Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Deck. Uh, it's also an interesting time, and it is also a good thing that this kind of topic and the dynamism we can observe in education now, we are all part of it, and hopefully, uh, in the nearest future, we think we'll be able to blend and be able to bring better learning environment for the students and ourselves. Thank you, Latif. Uh, Joseph, take away his uh, comments, closing statement. Okay. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's very interesting, especially since uh, I come from a country where it's really hard to get uh, I think it, we will have a big challenge trying to do like take this step into, um, even now when uh, I talk with some students in my university, I would notice how a lot of uh, staff, faculty staff will have problems even with Zoom, for example. So I, I, I can see already the challenge that it will represent to, to adapt to new technologies being used in the educational environment. And yeah, I think um, we will need to work on that. And I, I'm, I am really, uh, excited about this and uh, that I got the chance to, to hear about this. So maybe I can like, um, bring something to the table when I, when I have to talk with uh, people from my country too. Great, anybody else with closing comments? I see Janet is there, Janet, any comments? So I'm sorry I missed the earlier talk. Um, I know that he, Dirk would have given a great talk so I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> That's, that's all. So, Dirk, closing comments? Yeah, I'm always excited to talk about something that isn't quite there yet, that some people would call outlandish and probably will say it's never going to happen. And we've been there before. So I remember when I first talked about cloud manufacturing, somebody called it some computing nonsense that nobody would ever be interested in. And then we took it to the ASME IDC conference, the first paper ever, and there was lots of interest, both from academia and from some industry folks. And it actually made a contribution to the birth of an entire new research field. So if I can make a little bit of that happen in this arena, I've achieved something. That's impact. Thank you. So thank you all very much. And uh, if you'd like to, to connect with Dirk, uh, you could look him up on the, on the internet. Or if you email me, I will, I will put you in touch with him. Uh, to share papers, to collaborate, to uh, get uh, mentorship, etc., etc., etc. He 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 really has pioneered a lot of phenomenal stuff, and we continue to collaborate. So with that, thank you all very much, and we look forward to seeing you all next week. At the, uh, 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 and and it'll be an interesting talk, and we look forward to that. So with that, thank you all very much indeed. Bye. Bye.